Hello, and welcome to part three of our lecture from chapter seven. In this part of the lecture, we'll talk about the center of gravity and the moment of inertia. Let's start here with an example involving something called gravitational torque. Suppose um, we have the gymnast here um, doing her routine on the high bar there, and we're interested in calculating what is the amount of torque created by gravity on her body? So we know that you know every point of her body has mass and that has weight. So there's a force pointing down and each one of those forces uh, creates a torque, uh, which is calculated by you know, the radius, the distance from the rotation axis, which is the bar. Uh, we have to calculate that radius to um, that specific point and then figure out um, what is the uh, force there? The problem here is that a, a body is made up of trillions and trillions of individual atoms, and every one of those atoms has mass. So the, the total torque is due to all of these trillions and trillions of little torques all acting together. So it would be a, a futile and impossible task to try to calculate the gravitational torque in that manner. Well, the good news is there is a, a nifty trick here. The solution is to use something called the center of gravity. The net force of gravity, in other words, the gymnast's weight, acts at a single point in her body called the CG, or center of gravity, producing the same net torque. So we can simplify this diagram here with all these trillions and trillions of little torques. With this diagram here, which has one single torque produced by the gymnast weight, which is just mg, and this weight acts at a point in her body, which is called her center of gravity. And so this is a, a, you know, a major uh, step in, in able to handle gravitational torques of extended objects like this. So what is this concept that um, we just introduced called the center of gravity? The center of gravity, um, which is also sometimes called the center of mass, it's a point inside an object that describes the average position of all the object's mass. Another way to think of it is the balance point of the object. So let's just go through some, um, some shapes here and um, talk about the center of gravity. So if we have a, um, a solid sphere, for example, um, a bowling ball or something like that, then the center of gravity is just going to be the, the center um, of the sphere. And that makes sense because that is the, the balance point of, of the sphere. Um, for something like a cube here, the center of gravity would be, you know, a point inside of the, the box there, right in the center. Um, <clears throat> if we have a dumbbell like this, um, the center of gravity would be right in the center of the handle here. Again, you can think of this as sort of the average position of all the mass. There's just as much mass on the left as there is to the right of this uh, CG point. Um, for something like this, uh, with a system like this, assuming that this system is balanced, all right, so notice the, the heavier child is closer to the pivot than the lighter child in order to balance the system, but if they are balanced, then that means the CG is directly above the pivot point here. It's right in at, at this point here. Um, for uh, something like a bat, um, which is has a non-uniform distribution of mass, Notice there's more mass over here on the right side of the bat compared to the left side where it's thinner. So the CG or balance point is gonna be shifted. It's not halfway across the bat, it's shifted over to the right. Um, interestingly, the center of gravity doesn't actually have to be um, inside the material of the object. So if we take a horseshoe like this, the CG point is actually um, floating out here in space and again, this represents the average position of all the mass of this um, uh, horseshoe. And one way you could check this would be to place this horseshoe on a real light, uh, for example, like a piece of cardboard and um, lay it horizontally, you know, like on a table. And you could find the balance point, you know, by trying trial and error, trying to balance it with your finger. And you would find that your finger would need to be on the cardboard at a position somewhere around here, which is shown. So now that we sort of have a idea of the concept of center of gravity, 
um, we sometimes need to calculate the center of gravity uh, quantitatively or precisely. And um, without going through you know, all of the, the theory behind this, basically um, the idea with the center of gravity is that there is no net torque if you were to balance something, uh, an object on the, the, the point uh, where its CG is. So um, using that, it's, uh, one can derive the formulas for calculating the position of the center of gravity. And so um, the, the trick here, or the, you know, the method, is to first choose an origin for your coordinate system. Now, you can choose any, any place you want um, in the system, but sometimes uh, some points are more convenient, as other, uh, more convenient than others. So and we'll go through an example in the next slide. Um, then the task is just to find the coordinates, the XY coordinates, in other words, the positions of all the objects that are in the uh, system. Once we have that, we can actually compute the X and the Y coordinates of the CG. So the X coordinates of the CG, which is denoted X sub CG, is given by, notice up here, we have the sum of all these products of the X coordinate times the mass. So X1, M1 plus X2, M2. So this is the first object. This is the second object. This is the third object. And we just repeat this as much as we need to. Um, on the bottom here is just the total mass of all the objects in the system. So that's just summing up all the masses. And likewise for the Y coordinate, we have up here a sum of products where each of the products, we take the Y coordinate of the object times its mass. And then we go to the second object, its Y coordinate, Y2 times mass two and y3, mass three, et cetera, et cetera. And again, we divide by the total mass. So let's go ahead and um, work through an example using um, this, these uh, equations here. So suppose we have um, a system which consists of these three balls of mass here, ball one, two, and three, and they are connected by um, lightweight rods. You know, you could think of these these could be like lumps of clay, and these could be like soda straws, something that is insignificantly light. So you can see the masses are given here for the three masses, and both of these rods here are one meter. So the, um, the idea here, or our goal, is to find the position of the object's center of gravity. So the way we're gonna do this is the first thing we have to do is, is choose a, uh, an origin for the uh, coordinate system that we're going to use. And again, there's, you know, we could choose any any point in this system as an origin, but it, it makes sense to choose um, this object down here. Um, first of all, it kind of looks like the origin of an XY coordinate system, so that'll make it easier to figure out in that sense. But also, um, this will give us a lot of um, zeros for um, coordinates, which will, will shorten our calculation somewhat. So if we choose this position right here in the center of mass two as our origin, we can sort of overlay an XY coordinate system shown here like this. Um, so let's go ahead and calculate the X uh, coordinate of the center of gravity. So remember what we're gonna do here. We take each object and we multiply its position in X times its mass. So let's start with object one here. Well, object one, has a coordinate of zero in the x direction, okay, because it's, it's right here on the y-axis. So we don't have to worry about that one. In fact, object two also has zero for an x2, uh, x2 is zero as well. So that term falls off. The only one we have to worry about is this one over here, object three, and it has a position of one meter, and it has a mass of, remember this one is two kilograms. So it's one meter times two kilograms. So we get two up here. And in the bottom, we have to add up all three masses, one kilogram plus one kilogram plus two kilograms. So that's four kilograms. So our X coordinate is two over four, which simplifies to one half. In other words, our X uh, coordinate of the center of gravity is at one half meter, okay? Now we have to do the same for the Y coordinate. So um, we follow the same procedure. Now we're looking at the Y coordinates. So this first mass up here, notice it has a, a position of one meter. That's the one here. That's Y1. And M1 is one kilogram. 
Now, the other two objects have no y position because they're down here on the x-axis or at the origin. So we have these sec this second term here goes to zero, and you know y3 is also zero, okay? So on the, in the numerator, we just have one times one, which is one. And in the denominator, we have again, the total mass, which is one plus one plus two, four kilograms. So our y coordinate is one fourth. So putting this together, the center of gravity is located at a position where x is one half, right here, and y is one fourth, which would be right here. So um, this is the uh, CG of this system. Notice it's, um, this, this tells us the, the average position of all the mass in this system. In the last um, part of this lecture, in part two, um, we did a problem like this where we found the net torque on a light beam balance. And in that problem, if you remember, um, it was it looked just like this, but in that case, we, we said we could ignore the uh, mass of the beam. We treated it as a very lightweight beam. Um, in this problem, we're going to include the fact that this beam here is heavy. For example, this could be a heavy board or a plank of wood. And then we have our 20 kilogram mass here and a 60 kilogram mass here. Um, we're told that the six meter long wood board has a mass of 45 kilograms. So obviously we can't ignore the, uh, the board here uh, because it's you know, considerably heavier than this mass over here. Um, so anyway, this system is uh, held like this and then it's released. And the question is, you know, first of all, what is the net torque? And then which direction does the balance fall? Is it gonna, uh, is it gonna rotate clockwise or is it gonna rotate counterclockwise? So our solution here is to draw and label the three forces that produce torque about the pivot point. So again, our pivot point, that's where it rotates. And obviously it's gonna rotate on this fulcrum here, this triangle that it's balanced on. Um, we've got three forces now. We've got this 20 kilogram mass with its weight force, M1G, pointing down. Over here, we have the 60 kilogram mass with its weight force, M2G, pointing down. But now we also have to include the mass of this board, okay? And remember the trick here is when we're dealing with gravitational mass of an extended object like this, all we have to do is find the CG of the board, the center of gravity of the board, and pretend that all of the weight of the board is acting at that point. So there's two things to do here. The first thing, how do we find the CG of this board? Well, we're assuming that this board is uniform. In other words, it's not thicker at one end than the other. So therefore, the CG is just halfway across the length of the board. All right, so um, let's look at the geometry here. Remember, the whole board was given as six meters. This distance was given as two meters. Therefore, we know this distance is four meters. Well, we know the CG must be three meters from each end because it's precisely halfway across the board. So if this is two meters, then this distance from the pivot to the CG must be one meter because the total distance from CG to the end is three meters in either direction. So now that we know where the CG is, we can, um, we can t say that the mass of the board is all directed right here on the CG and that weight force of the board points down at that point. So the, the net torque then, what we're gonna do is add up all the torques so remember um, the sign of torque. These two torques uh, due to this force and this force are causing this thing to rotate in this direction, which is counterclockwise. Those are positive torques. So we're gonna add these torques together. So I have four meters times this uh, M1G, is this gravity uh, from that blue box right there. The um, board has a torque Remember the radius here is one meter, and then we're gonna multiply that by the board's weight, which is M sub B, B for four times G. And then this torque over here, remember, is it wants to cause this thing to rotate in a clockwise direction. So this is a negative torque, so we're gonna subtract that one. Its radius is two, um, and then we'll call this M1. Uh, actually, let's see. Um, sorry, that's a typo there. This is this should be M2G. This is the 60 uh, kilogram mass over here. 
So now we can put these numbers in. So M1 is 20, the mass of the board is 45, and the mass of this uh, box over here is 60 kilograms. So we multiply all these together, add them together. Remember, this one is subtracted, and we end up with 49 Newton meters. Now, our answer here is a positive torque. So that means this beam now is going to rotate um, counterclockwise direction because of the sign, because of that positive sign there. Here's a little uh, different example. This is to calculate the torque on a leaning flagpole. So a 10 meter long flagpole with a mass of 50 kilograms leans at a 75 degree angle as shown. So here's our, our leaning flagpole. We're gonna ignore the weight of the flag. We'll assume the flag is light compared to the metal pole. Um, and let's see, we're gonna calculate the torque on the flagpole caused by its weight. So again, uh, the trick here is to consider this pole and find its CG. So the CG of a long pole like this is halfway up the pole. So if the pole is a length of 10 meters, the CG is five meters from the ground. We know this angle is 75 that was given. And remember the entire weight of the pole acts at the CG. So here we have our, our weight W, which is MG pointing straight down at this point here, okay? Now remember though, that torque is the radius, you know, which is five meters times the perpendicular force component. So we just, we can't multiply this five meters times this weight here. We have to find this perpendicular component of the weight, which is given by MG, which is the hypotenuse, times the sine of 15. Now, how did I get 15 degrees? Well, there's a right triangle here, and we know this side down here is 75 degrees, this side's 90. So remember the angles of a triangle have to add up to 180. So that means this angle up here must be 15 degrees. Um, if this angle is 15, then this angle here is also 15. These are alternate interior angles. So um, this, um, this is another right triangle here, and it has the same angles. It's, a, it's 75, 90, and 15, but this component here is mg sine 15. So plugging in all our numbers, uh, the radius or distance to the CG is five meters. The mass of the flagpole is 50 kilograms. G is 9.8, and the sine of 15 is 0 0.26. So that gives us a, uh, a torque of 634 Newton meters. Um, the other thing we can do here um, is use the moment arm, um, which is another method here uh, to find the same answer, but I won't go through that in detail right now. There's kind of a fun application of um, center of gravity, um, which involves a strength contest, um, which can be held uh, between guys versus girls. And um, this is sometimes called the chairlift challenge. You may have heard of it. It kind of went viral about a year ago, but it's been around for decades. Um, I, I know at least 50 years ago, uh, they used to do this on some television shows and so forth, but it's kind of a fun thing. And I, I really highly recommend you do this at home um, and try it. Um, the rules are you stand um, two foot lengths from the wall. You'll see how to, how to pace that off with your feet um, in, the, in the video clip that follows. And then you bend over so your head touches the wall and you, know, you put a box or like a chair or something under here and you have to um, lift up the chair and then all you have to do is stand up straight. Um, so um, it doesn't sound like it's that difficult to do, but interestingly, um, almost um, always, um, only girls are able to do this um, strength contest and guys, um, sorry, but we fail miserably. So take a look at the video clip um, and um, you can also, if you wanna see some other video clips, just Google uh, chairlift challenge. There are a bunch of them on YouTube and some of them are pretty entertaining. Um, but uh, again, please try this um, at home and, and see how, how you do and can you do it? Can you do the, the chairlift challenge? So, stay against the wall. Yeah. One behind that one. Yeah. One behind the other. Yeah. Together. Yeah. Lean against. Yeah. Right. Bring it in. Back it up like an arm. Turn into it. Up. <laughs> Both feet against the wall. 
Right, one behind the other one. The other one behind that one. Both feet together, don't move. Don't keep head against the wall. Head against the wall, don't move your feet. Don't cheat. Head against. Right now, don't move your head now. Pull this up to your chest. And stand up. <laughs> stand up, Jen. <laughs> Can you not stand up? I've got all kind of muscles that are able to do it. How do I do this? Just up. Oh, okay. What? That's really weird. No, 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 I can do it without. Well, you saw in the video that um, the man, the guy couldn't pick up the chair. He failed miserably. And for the uh, woman in the video, she did it easily, right? So um, what's, the, what's going on here? Well, this has to do with the fact that women tend to have a lower CG than men due to different body shapes. Men have more mass in their upper body relative to their lower body. Um, men typically have wider shoulders, narrower hips, and shorter legs. So um, what this does then is um, a woman's CG, when she leans forward like this, tends to be over her feet. And we'll learn that um, in the next chapter that that's the requirement to be balanced. As long as your CG is over your, um, your, your base, basically, where your, you know, your feet in this case, then you are balanced. But look where the man's CG is. His is shifted upward, higher up in his body. It's not over his feet, it comes out in front. So when he tries to, when he lifts his head away from the wall, he's going to fall forward. He, he simply is unbalanced. So uh, again, uh, please try this. Um, have fun and uh, maybe you can challenge your, your friends or your roommate or your, uh, your mom or dad or something and have some fun with this one. Um, you can maybe uh, win a bet. Well, now that we've talked about center of gravity, let's move on to our second topic of this video. And that is the concept called rotational inertia, uh, which is often called moment of inertia. In fact, your textbook calls it the moment of inertia. I tend to like to use the term rotational inertia because it's more descriptive. All right, but um, here, here's what we're going to do. Imagine that we have two objects here. Um, one is a solid disk, all right, made out of wood, and the other is a hollow hoop like this, okay, or a ring. And um, both of these objects, that, now the ring is made of metal, okay? Um, but that's really not the key thing. The key thing is that both of these objects have the exact same radius or diameter. They're the same size. Um, the other thing is they both have the exact same mass, okay? Let's say they both have a mass of one kilogram. So they have the same shape, the same size, and the same mass. And we're gonna put them on a, on a ramp like this and let them go and let them roll down to have a race. So um, who do you think will win the race? Will it be the solid disc? Will it be the hollow hoop? Or the third choice, will it be a tie? Um, think about this, pause the video, think about it, and then watch the following demonstration. Once I remove the piece of wood, uh, one of them is going to rotate more quickly. Let's see which one that is. So you saw in the video that the solid disk wins the race. Now, why is that? Well, the distribution, even, even though both objects here have the same mass, you know, they're both round and they have um, the same diameter, the distribution of mass is very different in the disc and the hoop. The hoop has all of its mass far away from the axis of rotation. Remember, the axis of rotation is right in the center, right? That's what it rotates about. This makes the hoop more difficult to rotate than the solid disc. The solid disc has its mass distributed everywhere. And some of the mass is very close to the center of the disc, which is what it rotates about. So what happens here is because the mass of the hoop is farther away from the axis of rotation, the hoop has more of what's called rotational inertia. 
and this makes it more sluggish for rotating or rolling. Okay, it's um, it, it makes it harder to turn, and that's why the disc rolls down the ramp faster. So this so-called moment of inertia or rotational inertia, as it's called, um, one way to explain it is by comparing it um, here with uh, using Newton's second law. So earlier in the course, you know, we used Newton's second law quite a bit. It says F equals MA, right? The net force is equal to the mass of the object times the acceleration. Now remember what mass is. Mass has inertia. This is the inertial mass of the system. And what inertia means is resistance to acceleration, okay? And what that simply means is when you push on something, it's going to accelerate. But the more mass it has, the harder it is to get it to accelerate, okay? It's like trying to push um, your car compared to an empty shopping cart, okay? There's no comparison there. All right, what we're gonna do in this later in this chapter is we are going to come up with the rotational form of Newton's second law, where the net force is replaced with the net torque. All right, remember the force here is what causes the effect, which is acceleration. Here we have net torque causes angular acceleration. Remember alpha is the angular acceleration of an object. But what is the resistance to this rotational acceleration? It's called the rotational inertia, and it's given the letter I. So notice that in these equations here, torque and force are the cause. Acceleration A, or angular acceleration, are the effect. And then the inertia here is the resistance to this, or here, it's the rotational inertia is what's the resistance to getting something to rotate. So this um, I is called the moment of inertia or the rotational inertia. It's the rotational equivalent of mass. Rotational inertia is the resistance of an object to angular acceleration. <clears throat> so in the video we just saw, we saw that the hoop had a higher um, I. It had a higher rotational inertia because its mass was distributed farther away from the, its center. That made it harder to roll and harder to rotate. That Therefore, the disc was faster when it rolled down the slope. Here's another example that sort of um, gives us a, a picture of what um, moment of inertia or rotational inertia is. Um, imagine you have um, some kids here on a playground uh, little ride, merry-go-round type ride. When the kids are distributed far away from the center here, the pivot, you'll find that it's much harder to push this to get it rotating. However, when the kids are towards the center here, if, they, if you have them move inside, you'll notice that this thing is much, much easier to push. You, could, you can push it much faster. And so the difference here between this picture and this picture is just the distribution of where the mass is. Here the mass is out farther away from the pivot, and this gives it a larger moment of inertia or a larger rotational inertia um, than this situation here. So in order to use rotational inertia um, to do rotational dynamics problems, which we will do in part four of this um, video lecture, we're gonna to have to know how to calculate the rotational inertia for an object or a system of objects. So um, we're gonna go through um, how to do this in the next few slides. So the simplest case is when we have a, a single object, um, a compact object, which is sometimes called a particle. Um, so for example, here the woman has a, a ball on a string and she's just spinning this thing around over her head. So for a, an object like this, the moment of inertia or rotational inertia I is calculated as M times R squared, where M is the mass and R is the radius, all right? And this is something that is, uh, you can prove this and, and derive this result. Um, you can find in your textbook, um, it shows the steps of how to do this, but 
we don't, it doesn't really concern us. We're just going to use this result here. Um, another example of this is let's say we have this um, pipe here with a, a thin uh, rod here, and at the end of the rod is attached some heavy weight. And this thing is spinning around like this, all right? We want to know what is the rotational inertia of this system. Well, we, assuming we can ignore this um, rod here, then this is the mass out here. We can use this formula. The rotational inertia I is just equal to this mass M times whatever radius this is squared. Now, what if we have more than one object in our system? Well, if we have multiple compact objects, all we do is add up the individual rotational inertias for each object and add them together. So in this picture here, we've got the two kids um, on a, uh, a little ride in the playground, and this thing is turning, this platform is turning. So the, the girl here has mass M1, and her distance from the pivot is R1. So her rotational inertia is M1 R1 squared. And then the boy over here has mass M2, and his uh, radius from the center is R2. So he, we would his uh, rotational inertia would be M2 times R2 squared. And if there were more kids on here, we would just continue adding them up. And then we just add all those together to get the total rotational inertia. So, you know, before uh, when we did problems with masses, we just added the masses. Now we have to add the rotational inertia. So it's, it's a little bit more complicated. Let's go ahead and do an example of calculating the moment of inertia using what we just learned. So here's our system. We have these two masses are connected by thin um, massless rods. So we have a 10 kilogram mass out here which is three meters from this, this is the pivot here, um, the axis or axle of rotation. And here we have a five kilogram mass, which is two meters from the axis. And you can see this thing is twirling around, okay? So what is the total uh, uh, moment of inertia or rotational inertia? Well, we take um, this mass, 10 kilograms, multiply it times its radius and square it. So it's three meters squared. And then we take this mass here, five kilograms, and uh, multiply it by its radius, which is two meters, and remember to square that. So here we have 90, notice the units are kilogram meters squared for this guy. And then this smaller mass here has less rotational inertia. It's 20 kilogram meters squared. And we just simply add these two numbers together to get a total rotational inertia of 110 kilogram meters squared. So notice that these are the units of rotational inertia. It's a mass kilograms times a radius meters squared. Now often in problems, um, the object that we're working with is not a simple um, compact object like we just did in the last couple of slides. Instead, it's um, it's an extended object, like um, a, a rod or a bar or a, um, a, a slab of material or a disc, a hoop, a sphere or a shell, a hollow shell. So in this case, um, the, the, the method for calculating the rotational inertia um, involves uh, some calculus. And the good news for us is we won't have to do that here in this course. We're just going to use this table and look up the rotational inertia or the moment of inertia for um, these common shapes, which often show up in problems. So to see how to do this, for example, if we have a thin rod of any cross section and it's rotating about this axis here. So in other words, this thing is spinning around like this in either direction. Um, you know, this could be like an airplane propeller or something. We might model uh, it using this. And notice it could be it doesn't have to have a square cross section like this. It can be a circular cross section. Um, whatever you know the cross section is, as long as it's a, a long thin rod like this rotating about the center, we just use this formula that they give us. The the I, the, the rotational inertia, is one twelfth m l squared, where m is the mass of the rod and l is the length of the rod. Now notice if it's um, rotating about one of the ends. So in other words, this whole thing is spinning around, then it's one third ML squared. 
Um, if we have um, a plane or a slab about the center, um, it's the same formula as for this. It's 1 12th m a squared, where a is this dimension of the slab. And notice it doesn't matter how long it is in this direction. There's no b in the formula. Um, how about for round shapes? These often show up in problems. Um, it, this is a solid cylindrical disc, okay? Um, so think of like a hockey puck, okay? Um, or it can be a real thin disc. For example, um, a compact disc or a DVD is actually a cylinder or a disc like this. And the equation here is one half m r squared, where r is the radius of the disc. And, no, and notice it's rotating about the center, like as if you rolled it down a, a ramp or something like that. Here's our cylindrical hoop, all right? And notice it has a larger moment of inertia than this solid one, given, and it's given by m r squared. So notice this hoop here has twice as much rotational inertia as the solid disk. So remember the race we had between these two objects? Now we can see why this object wins. Its moment of inertia or rotational inertia is only half as much as this one. So it's it's um, easier to get this one spinning, all right? And that's why it rolled faster down the ramp. Now this is a solid sphere. So this would be um, something like um, a solid ball, like a billiard ball, a bowling ball, a cannon ball, something like that. Its rotational inertia is given by 2 fifths mr squared. And this is a hollow sphere. So think of like a basketball, right? It has a hollow shell, but it's filled with air or a volleyball or a soccer ball. It has a rotational inertia given by 2 thirds m r squared. So we'll end this uh, lecture with um, another race here. Um, so look at this one. This is the great race of five different shapes. Um, we've got our competitors here are, this is a, a it's not gonna roll, it's gonna slide. It's a, it's a cube and we're gonna assume that it rolls, or I'm sorry, slides down this ramp without any friction. The other objects are all gonna roll. So we have a solid cylinder here we have a cylindrical shell or a hoop, and then we have a solid sphere like the bowling ball, and then we have a spherical shell like a basketball. So um, if we have a race with these objects, um, try to think about which one might win, you know, who will be the fastest and which one might be the slowest. Um, uh, you can go ahead and pause the video um, if you want a hint for how to predict the outcome, look at the last, you know, go back in the video to the last slide and think about rotational inertia of all these objects. And then we'll go ahead and do the race. So here they go. It, it repeats over and over. Okay, so, so who wins the race? Well, amazingly, the, the cube does, that doesn't roll, that slides. Now, why is that? Well, think about how much rotational inertia does this cube have? None, right? It's not rotating at all, it's just sliding. So it, it, it uh, gets down fastest. Um, after that, the one with the least amount of rotational inertia, if you look on the table, is the solid uh, sphere. So that's this guy here. And then the slowest one, again, is this blue hoop here. And the reason for this is, again, all of its mass is located around the outside of the object, farthest from the axis. That gives it the highest rotational inertia, meaning it's the most sluggish uh, for rolling. So that is the end of this portion of the video. I hope you enjoyed this and learned something. And um, I'll see you soon in part four of this chapter. Goodbye.